Welcome on in, Eagles fans, to episode 56 of the No Huddle Show, our Philadelphia Eagles podcast right here on NJ.com. I'm Joe Giglio, joined as always by Elliot Shore Parks and Mark Echo. They cover the Eagles for NJ Advanced Media. They were at Lincoln Financial Field on Sunday to watch the Eagles drop another game, 27-22. This loss at the hands of the Washington Redskins. The Eagles had a chance at the end to go down and win the game. It did not work out. Now 5-8 and eight on the season, four straight losses, a 3-0 and start. Uh, has become what we probably thought it was going to be before the year. Certainly a lot of people did. Now the Eagles at 5-8. and eight. Elliot, we'll start with you. That game on Sunday, I, mean, I think the one thing we could start with is, because last week we didn't get to record a show, and there was a lot of question about effort um, and where the Eagles were in terms of the players giving their all. I, I didn't think that was a question at all on Sunday. They just weren't good enough. Yeah, I mean, like you said, we didn't record one last week, so we missed everybody, you know, talking about the poor showing against the Bengals. But... You know, I think yesterday showed that that the loss to the Bengals was just a bad loss. And yes, there were some plays where they maybe didn't give full effort. But yesterday, I agree with you. I thought the the effort was way better. I mean, I'm sure that's not really what fans want to hear right now after the loss. I mean, the Eagles should should play hard every week, and I think they'll they would tell you they do. But I agree. Last uh, on Sunday, it was noticeable how how much better how much better they played overall. And really, they in a lot of ways dominated the Redskins. I mean, you know, they moved the ball up and down the field. They didn't finish in the red zone, which has been a problem this season and was a problem, you know, uh, on Sunday. Um, you know, they took the lead late in the game, but the defense comes up small again. And, uh, you know, I wrote uh, Monday morning on NJ.com that, you know, everyone's going to point to Doug Peterson and the receivers when you talk about why the season kind of fell apart after 3-0. and But, Jim Schwartz deserves just as much blame, if not more, than than Doug Peterson. I mean, over these past four games where really the season has been on the line, I mean, this is really where the season's falling apart. The defense has given up 27 points to the Redskins, 32 to the Bengals, 27 to the Packers, and 26 to the Seahawks. And if you look at even the division games, 28 to the Giants, 29 to the Cowboys, 27 in the first time against the Redskins. I mean, they have the defense has not been good this year. Yes, the offense has struggled. There's no denying that. But, you know, to say that the defense, which should be better, they have the talent to be better than they are. And they, they're, they're supposed to have the defensive coordinator make them better than they are. So yesterday, I thought that, that was my big takeaway is, you know, I, everyone's going to leave that game thinking they need to sign to sign Deshaun. But I think my big takeaway was this defense has big problems at cornerback and the defensive coordinator has not been getting the job done. Yeah, Mark, before we get your take, I mean, to go to that point, Elliot, <clears throat> excuse me, on on, you know, the way they played and the way that game played out, if the defense played better. I mean, you would think they won in, in terms of yesterday. They had more first downs, better third down efficiency, more net yards, more offensive plays, more passing yards, more time of possession. And usually you win that game, but it was big plays allowed by the defense that really, you know, gave the Redskins a lot of points in quick fashion. Mark, your takeaway after the fourth straight loss here. Well, first, let me just say, Elliot, Grasshopper, you've come a long way. You've finally seen the light. I've been telling you this defense stinks from the beginning of the season, but I kept hearing how great Jim Schwartz was and how this defensive line dominates teams and all these great things. about this defense has always stunk. Kim Schwartz is the most overrated coach in the history of football, maybe. He's going to get a head coaching job. Yeah, maybe at Temple. They probably don't even want him. Come on. It's terrible. Why nine? Didn't we see that fail before here? My God, this defense. Well, yesterday, I mean, we're doing this podcast on a Monday morning. Yesterday, obviously, the, the big plays were the thing. And that's that, to me, is the most alarming thing, Mark, of, of this Eagles team. And why? Because a lot of the games that they, they're not blown out. I mean, the Bengal game was an aberration. But most of these won't, games, they won't, have a chance. Straight. They did but, lose straight by double figures. They did. But most of the games, they've had a shot in. The Bengal game, that one was over really from the jump. But what gets you in these games is the Eagles, the two things they don't have that you need to have in the NFL is they don't stop big plays, whether it be – Yep. Sunday in the run game or the pass game, and they don't make big plays on offense. It's very tough to win like that. Yes, it is, and that's that's because they don't have playmakers. They don't have any playmakers on either side of the ball. Jordan Matthews is a, is a nice player. He's a nice player. He's a good guy. If if he's he could be a a nice piece to a to a very good team. If he's on a very good team, he's probably your slot receiver, which he is here. But he, I mean, he'd be your third guy, and he'd be a great third guy. You know, he, he'd be a very good addition to the New England Patriots or the, um, you know, Seattle. He'd be perfect in, in Seattle, say. But here he has to be, like, the best guy, and that's not what he is. Uh, defensively, I mean, come on. this I, I, I never saw it. I never saw this. Everyone was raving about this defense all year. They don't do anything. They don't make any plays. They, Fletcher Cox played well yesterday, had a couple sacks. 
He's a, he's their best player, and we, everybody knows that. Brandon, I keep hearing about Brandon Graham going to the Pro Bowl. Brandon Graham doing this. Brandon Gra- Brandon Graham's a guy. He's just a guy. Five sacks. Okay, I, I mean, uh, like fifty people have five sacks. He's just a guy. See, I, I think the linebackers I, are, are 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 nothing. The corners are terrible. Malcolm Jenkins, uh, you know, he he makes his one play a year. And that's about it. I, I disagree, though, that, that that there's no playmakers on defense. I'm, I, I, Same I, I, with Fletcher Cox. All right. I, well, here, let me say yeah, I, I, the defensive line. The defensive line, I think, has not played up to its potential. I think that they have the good potential, players. What's the potential? <laughs> you think I, I think they are. I think they have good players on the defensive line. I think I know you. I know you're not big on Brandon Graham, but it's I think okay. he's a guy. He's a but guy. No, I think he's better than a guy. It's I think five he, sacks. fifty guys. Right. Five sacks. But, but if no, you do, no. if you look at pressures this right. year, oh, stop, stop. No, but but that, no, that's part of the game. You, you look at if you look at pressures, he's right up there with any edge rusher in the NFL. So oh, he does have that. What's pressure? It means you didn't get a sack. No, it right. means you move the quarterback off the spot, okay. and a lot of times they moved Kirk Cousins to 116 quarterback rating yesterday. No, all right, but he didn't have a good game yesterday. But I'm saying to, to just completely throw he's away all guy. the guy. He's had. a guy. It's all he ever is. That's all he'll ever be. He's, no, like, he's better than a guy. He's, no, a, he's, good, he's a guy. All right. Okay, well, I disagree. Yeah. Well, you disagree all you want. He has five sacks. All right, but you right, just but sacks are not the only way. The sacks are not the only way to assess a defensive lineman. I mean, that that's that's one way to do it. Can we can we put a, yeah, how about how about making a big play when it counts? I'm with you. They haven't made. They have not made enough of those. There's no doubt about it. My my point is this. My ultimate point is this. I think I agree, I agree with you. And I've agreed with you since training camp in week one that the cornerbacks are a big problem on the team. But I disagree with you that I think they have a front seven and a pair of safeties that are good enough that they should be playing better. That they should not be well, giving up as many points as they are. What? The, the quarterbacks were to blame when Chris Thompson runs 25 yards on on touch for a touchdown to win the game. Yeah, that all right. That was all right. They didn't play well yesterday, and that was one play. But I'm saying, but I'm saying when you look at the defense, I think they're like I just said, their front seven and their safeties are good enough where they should be better than they are. And I think that's why a lot of the blame falls on Jim Schwartz for this. Which which one of the linebackers is is playing great for you? Hicks I think Jordan, well. Hicks Jordan is Hicks well. is playing well. Nigel Braddon has been decent this year. Again, what has Hicks made a play this year? Yeah, I mean, he made I one yesterday on the screen pass in the fourth quarter. He just sniffed that out from the jump. He made a play there. I mean, all right, I'll give you that one. I mean, but come, <laughs> uh, you guys are watching something different than than I. Well, I mean, I don't think me, me or Joe are not saying that that the defense is is good. We're saying they have the talent to be better than they I are. I don't. I disagree. You disagree. So you see, I think that. So you. So you don't think Jim Schwartz? Is I think like, no. Schwartz is terrible. I told you. He's okay, but if Schwartz, but my point is, if they don't have the talent, then how can you blame Schwartz? He's not getting what he has. He's not getting the most out of what he does have. And he's the one that brought in some of the talent. He well, brought exactly. in Adam. He brought in Tulloch. He brought in McKelvin. He brought in Brooks. They're his guys. Right. And that, that's you can't what Doug Peterson for those guys, or even Howie. As much as I like to blame Howie, they're Jim. They, they, were, they were recommended by Jim Schwartz, right? We all know that. They all played for him before. Right. In Buffalo, sure. And or Detroit. Right, let, me, let, me, wait, let me say two things. One, I do think you can still blame Howie for the signing because ultimately Jeff Lurie has made it clear that. All personnel moves and responsibility falls on him. I agree with you. Jim Schwartz told Howie to sign them. Asked, but end of the- he asked him. He didn't tell him he, how he had to go along. How he could have said, "Hey, no, Kim, listen, I don't want McKelvin." Right. Which I and, and and honestly, I don't even know if that's the right way to do it because if you bring in Jim Schwartz, I do think then you have to give him some say in who he brings in. But my point is, I still think when you look at the job Howie's done over this past year, he deserves blame for the Leotis McKelvin signing. You can't go into the season thinking he's going to be your number one cornerback, even if Schwartz tells you that. But two. I, to back to, to to Mark's point a few moments ago, like I I the reason I blame Schwartz more I think than Mark does. Well, I'm with, no, I'm with you on Schwartz. Believe me, I'm with you on Schwartz. But, but my I, point is you overrated the talent. But my point is you can't say that Jim Schwartz is doing a terrible job and say they have no talent. Like I feel like it's got to it's got to be one or the other. You know what yeah. I mean? Like like it, it's either it's either they don't have the talent to to have a good job. Or they don't have the coaching. I mean, guess it could be a mixture of the two, but I'm I lean more on that the talent is there, and I don't think Jim Schwartz has done a good job. I agree with half of that. <laughs> well, I think the front four has shown in the past that there some like Vinny Vinny Curry. Let's use let, let's use Vinny Curry as an example, since everybody wants to rip him for because they gave him a lot of money, and he's not putting up big numbers at all. But he's not playing. Like, why aren't they coaching him up? Why they're using him all the wrong ways? 
They're using him inside. They're using him. He played 15 snaps yesterday. What do you expect him to do in 15 snaps? Do you think Vinny Curry is a good player? I think there's potential. I'll, I'll use your word. I think that he <laughs> has the potential to be a good player. He's not playing like a good player this this year, but I don't think he's being used pro- being used properly. So that's why I'm ripping the coaches as well. I don't know Vinny Curry. I'm not sure. I thought two years ago he was a very good player. So who do you think is more the problem on the defensive side of the ball, Schwartz or the players? Combination of both. See, I, I lean Schwartz. I think I, I think this season, and well, I should say this season, because at the beginning of the season they did play well. The players but, make plays. Though. He could, I mean, he, he can only put a, put out there what he has. Schwartz didn't I, tell him to let Thompson run 25 yards for a touchdown. He didn't coach I, him to do that. <laughs> I know. I agree. But I'm saying I think if you look over the stretch of two months, the defense – has not begun. I mean, everyone wanted to rip Billy Davis the past three seasons because his defense started out good, and at the end of the season they faltered. Well, it's the same thing happening. So that I mean, maybe in that way it is the players. But you know, I think if Billy Davis's name was on the job Jim Schwartz has done this year, I think people would be far more outraged about Absolutely. it. Absolutely, because people for some reason fell in love with this guy. Thought he was going to be really good. I, I guess they didn't check his record. Well, he has had good defenses before, but how? And ten, a hundred years ago. Well, they were good in Buffalo, I think, at the end. But regardless, for one year. Regardless, I, I, I agree with you that the Jim Schwartz hype, and we said this, even though I said at the beginning they're doing a good job, we also said that it was getting out of control because people were expecting way too much out of him. But the interesting thing is, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, what will happen with Doug and all those things, and I think at this point all three of us agree that Doug's probably back. I mean, 85 90% that he's back. It's Jim Schwartz is probably back too, but, I mean – it's easier to fire a defensive coordinator than it is a head coach. It'll be interesting to see if six, seven games in the next year, if the defense is still fall, you know, not playing well, what happens. Yeah, and you would wonder if you know, you'd expect improvement if they do go out there and fix the defense or keep fixing it, right? If they draft a corner or two and they add another linebacker or whatever, then, then really people will expect defensive improvement. If they don't get it, then it'll come back to Schwartz. So the Eagles dropped the game 27-22. They've lost four in a row. They're 5-8. and eight. Um, I think for now we could we could put aside all those sort of crazy scenarios of what it could take. I mean, this season is for all intents and oh, purposes. They're eliminated. they're eliminated. Yeah, they're, they're, it's over. I mean, the season is over. I mean, uh, officially, mathematically, they're, they 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 can't. They're done. Yeah, if, if five and eight, it's over. Even if they got to eight and eight, but that's now now what is it about? That that's where I wanted to go with this because all right, th- I think this whole week and Elliot, you touched on it. There was all that conversation last week. Are the players quitting? Are they done with Doug? Are, you know, is this whole thing going to spiral out of control? For one week at least, they played hard. They lost. They didn't play well enough. They made mistakes, but they played hard. You could see that. The effort was there. So now what? Elliot, we'll start with you on this one. For you, and then we'll get to Wentz and the way he played yesterday and all the other things that went on that game, but what is this season about the rest of the time as you watch it for the last three games, Baltimore, New York, and Dallas? It's about what it's been about all season, which is Carson Wentz. I mean, we, we can nitpick and say, you know, maybe you would like to see Vitae come back. And, I, you know, I think you can make an argument for when Lane Johnson comes back, putting him at tackle and sitting Jason Peters down and seeing how the Vitae-Lane Johnson combination works and all that stuff. But outside of that, I mean, I don't really think there's a lot of players on the roster right now where you look and you say, maybe they'll be back, maybe they won't. I mean, we all know they're going to get, you know, a bunch of new receivers. Um, the cornerbacks clearly aren't aren't going to be back besides Jalen Mills. Um, offensive line, I mentioned by Ty and Johnson. So, I mean, there's running backs. Ryan Matthews is probably gone, and they'll bring one in. I guess you want to see Smallwood, but I think you've seen him quite a bit this year, and, you know, he's looked okay. So I think it's about Wentz. I think yesterday, even though they lost, um, I thought Carson Wentz played, played really well. Um, at the end of the, you know, I, I even think he improved in late-game situations. So far this year, going in to yesterday – you know, I think he had four chances where he had the ball at the game, either tied or they were behind in the final minutes, and he wasn't able to get anything going. Yesterday, you know, it looked like he was going to lead him in for the score. He had three, four completions in a row, was moving the ball well, and then he got sacked, and, you know, that happens. But I thought he showed improvement yesterday. I thought his accuracy was much better. So going into these next three games, you know, there was a reason yesterday when Zach Harris was asked after the game, why are you optimistic about the future? And Erd said, first and foremost, it's Wentz. So you want to end this season on a good note. You want to see Wentz take a step, you know, maybe just a baby step each week and continue to improve. And if that happens, um, even if they lose the next three games, I think you can end the season on a somewhat positive note. Yeah, Elliot, I'm with you on that. And I, I thought Wentz on Sunday, we're doing this podcast on Monday morning. I know, I know the, the stats, when you add them all together, they weren't great, but I thought he played – 
He played well. I mean, he had to get away from the, the pass rush under duress the entire game. He made the mistake, the interception in the end zone. He missed Burton on the play where he broke it, and he could have had a giant play. But other than that, I, I thought he played really well, and I was encouraged. But probably his best game in months. Mark, for you, as we look forward, what what is important for the Eagles and for you watching them the last month, the last three games of the year? Well, you know, you guys said it is about Wentz. Obviously, I'm not as high on Wentz's performance yesterday as both of you guys are. I think he played well, but he two red zone turnovers are, un, are inexcusable. He just that's you, you don't win games when you when you throw an interception in the end zone and you yes, he got sacked. You don't have to fumble. He did, you know. I mean, he lost the ball. You get sacked, you get sacked. You hold on to the ball. Um, you know, I mean, I, I I think if Sam Bradford had that same exact game that, that Carson Wentz had yesterday, Elliott would be doing a slideshow with 30 quarterbacks he'd rather have. Well, well all right, let me let me counter that. The difference is if Sam Bradford had that game as a rookie, I don't think I would. Bradford probably had a lot of games just like that when he was a rookie. They're the same yeah. guys. People were encouraged. I mean, Bradford was rookie of the year. It's since what happened after that that's been disappointing. Right. Tore his knee up a couple times. Yeah, no. And if, if Carson Wentz, six years in, has this type of game in this type of spot – and they they drop to five and eight. I will say he's not good, but but the, to I agree with you that the Reds an interception that was that was really bad. That was a bad throw. It was a bad read. There's really you know it just was a really bad bad throw. The difference between judging Carson Wentz now as opposed to comparing him to even you know Kirk Cousins or somebody that that's a few years into his career is he is just a few games into his career. And I think that when you look at each of his games, yes, there's going to be negatives, but I still think yesterday and I don't think this was the case against the Bengals against the Packers he was okay but coming off that Bengals game I thought there was a lot more negative than there was positive but against the Redskins I thought there was much more positive than there was negative and going forward if he has the same game he does if he has close to the same game he does he had against the Redskins over these next three games maybe improves a little bit I think that'll be encouraging given how he had played going into Sunday yeah, I I, he didn't play badly. He didn't play badly at all. I don't think he. I think he played. He played okay. I mean, he, you know, I wasn't like wow yesterday. He did move around a lot. I mean, he's showing even against the Bengals. All even through this losing streak, the one thing to me that st- that has stood out about Carson Wentz, and it's funny because right before it started, we had talked about this that he hadn't shown a lot of um, his mobility, his athleticism. He just wasn't. I mean, not that he didn't have it. He just wasn't being asked to being asked to use it as much. Um, I mean, he got sacked four times yesterday. He could have been sacked eight or nine times, probably. Yeah. He he avoided some. I don't know how he avoided a couple of them. Um, and like you said, you know, but but and that's all well and good. That that's a good that's a good good trait to have, especially if you're going to play behind the offensive lineman that the Eagles have. I'm almost willing to say though, and you guys are going to disagree with me here, but if and we'll find out later Monday how how bad some of these guys are hurt and what's going on with Brandon Brooks, but. If they got to put that line out there next week against Baltimore, I might play Chase Daniel. Well, yeah. well I'll say this. That was going to be a difficult spot in Baltimore um, against it. They're trying to keep up with the Steelers. That defense is really good. It is worrisome, Mark. I mean, that when you're in your fourth string right tackle, I mean, I probably wouldn't go as far as what you just said, but I, it's worrisome. It, it has to be oh, no. fourth string right tackle. And he was under duress all day and, and really – I mean, you think about. I mean, I, what do you guys have any idea? I mean, was there anything more than what Peterson said about what went on with Brandon Brooks? Because it was just so strange. You turn the game on. I turned on. A, you know, about twenty minutes before the game started, and he's just not there. And then, did you got? What did you make of the way Peterson described what was going on with Brandon Brooks in the post game, uh, Elliot? Well, it just it seemed like either didn't have an answer for you guys, or was just. I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he didn't seem happy about the entire situation. Well, how could I mean? How could he be happy? I mean, it's hard to be mad at a guy for being sick, right? Unless, unless you think he's faking it, and I don't think. I mean, yeah, this isn't you know like twelfth grade. I mean, you know, like people don't be fake being sick. But I mean, I, I'll talk to I talked to Chase Daniel about it after the game, and he said he didn't find out for, uh, that uh, Brooks wasn't playing until he got back in from warm up. So I mean, that's like forty minutes before the game. I mean. Uh, you know, players, well, I guess, were kind of just as confused as media members and fans were when they found out. And this is the second time this season it's happened. It happened to him last year in Houston. Um, I don't know. I mean, this isn't like, you know, talking about an ACL or an ankle sprain or something where we see it all the time and you can kind of get an opinion on it. I mean, if he gets sick and he can't play, I mean, he can't play. So I don't know if it's something he's eating the, the night before. Um, I mean, he's it's only happening before home games both times this year and the players do stay in a hotel the night before um but i can't imagine he ate the same thing that caused him to miss the packers game so i don't know what it is i mean 
at last time after he was sick, he basically just said, yeah, I was sick and now I feel better. And what really, what really kills the Eagles with this is outside of just, you know, the concern for Brooks health is you go all week preparing for a game thinking it's going to be Brooks. And then at the last minute, it's not. And when, you know, with Jordan Matthews and his ankle sprain during the week, you can kind of prepare, you know, maybe uh, give Paul Turner a few more reps because you kind of have an idea that Jordan Matthews might be able to go full if he even does play or whatever. But with Brooks, you thought he was going to be there. I mean, you know, it's not a position where you rotate guys in or out. And then in, in 40 minutes for the game, you know, Samalu finds out he's going to be starting. So that's what really hurts the Eagles about this Brooks thing is the timing of it is just, I mean, if Brooks got sick on a Wednesday, you know, it's not as big of a deal. But the fact that it happens 40 minutes before the game is, it's, it's huge. I mean, it really throws off almost a, an entire week of, of practice. You know what, what people forget? I mean, you know, fans I'm talking about now for the most part, or even us sometimes, but, you know, these football players are, are people. They're, I mean, yes, they're, 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 they're great athletes. They're, they, they, they can do things that the common man can't do. They're bigger, stronger, faster, whatever, but they're human. I mean, he got sick. I mean, I know a hundred people that have gotten sick in the last month over what, I mean, he didn't do it on purpose. He didn't, I mean, he wanted to play yesterday. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's not like, you know, he, he got out. He got sick. I, I, I don't know. We don't. I mean, I think the the interesting thing about it though is like a couple of things. One, you know, he got sick, but to you know, for me or you or Joe to call out of a day of work is a little different than it is for for him to to miss a game. I mean, to well, miss a game, but you if have you're to sick, get... you're sick. Whether you're a sports writer or a football player, a truck driver, a, working at the a grocery store, if you're sick, you're sick. You're still human. Humans get sick. No, no, I, I, I'm not. I'm not saying he should have played. What I'm saying is, I think the fact that this has happened two times in three, three weeks, right? Because be- I'm worried. I'm more worried. I think right. I'm worried about it. I think it could. He could have something. And I've been sick. I mean, he might have something that he's not aware of, and he could really get this checked out for real and find out what it is. Right, and that that that's what that that's what I'm saying is the fact that it hits so violently. The night before games, twice in three weeks. It's just, it, this was even the night. This was the day of, right? Well, yeah, we haven't spoken to him, so we don't know when he started to feel sick. But, but it, it was it was the night before the Packers game, I think. I think he was throwing up that night. And then, regardless, I mean, the the point is, it just it's interesting. Like you're right, I know people that are sick, but it's just interesting because you don't hear it a lot in the NFL of a guy not playing the day before the game because he's sick. Normally, it's you know some type of physical injury, not not so, well, I, mean, I guess being sick is physical, but it's like an ankle or something. And that's just that that's why I think it's it's interesting that it it, it keeps happening. I don't, I don't know what to well, make. I think it's more than, like I said, I'm I don't know him that well because he just got here, but I'm concerned for the guy. I think there's something wrong. I think it's more than just he ate bad chicken wings or something or you know. <laughs> I think it's I think he may have a serious medical issue that's because we don't, like you said, we we don't know if he's been sick on Mondays during the year. We don't see him on Monday or Tuesday. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. And nobody cares because you know he, we're not, you know, not to say it that way, but you know what I'm saying. It's not as big of a deal, right. right? We wouldn't even know if he didn't miss. You know what I'm saying? So, I'm. I think I would be. I'm concerned for him for his health. I mean, this is. We could talk football. All we want who's playing good, who's playing bad. Health is, is – is, and if this is something that's a chronic thing, he's got to get it taken care of sooner than later. He does. And and yesterday, and we're doing this podcast on a Monday morning, it, it hurt the Eagles. Uh, obviously, you know, he was sick, and we wish him to get better. But you add it all together. He wasn't there. Then all the right tackles go down. The long snapper goes down. I mean, it was just like – you couldn't even imagine – you couldn't even predict – if you tried what was going on in that fourth quarter in front of, you know, with the Eagles line, whether it be the long snapper on special teams or the offensive line. And obviously it ended with Wentz getting hit there um, and fumbling the ball at the end. And the Eagles, you know, don't, they don't have the opportunity to, to see if he could throw the ball in the end zone to win the game. Uh, we do have to have the conversation guys before we go any further, I think about the Sean Jackson, right? It was a, twice this year. It has been a talking point leading up to a game against the Redskins. I think Deshaun has played a big role in that with the kind of the way he's, answered some questions and left the door open and and gotten people you know thinking about the idea of his possible return to Philadelphia next season he did it again yesterday with that security guard before the game and then he does Elliot what he's done basically since he left the Eagles which is torch the Eagles an 80 yard touchdown pass right out of halftime three catches 102 yards I mean Deshaun doesn't have great numbers this year at all and when he since he's left the Eagles his numbers have not been outstanding it's it's more of the same big plays and not a lot of substance but when he plays the Eagles, he's vintage Deshaun Jackson. 
Yeah, and you know, you look on on his season two two years ago when he first left when he first left the Eagles and went to the Redskins. He had thir- in his first season with the Redskins. He had thirteen catches of forty yards or more, including his long touchdown yesterday. This season, he only has four. So Eagles fans see Deshaun Jackson twice a year, and they go because you know a lot of Eagles fans don't watch Redskins games outside of when they play the Eagles, and they go, "Oh man, this guy's still the same guy." He he might be the same guy in reputation, and when you're talking about a guy that stretches the field, that does mean a lot. Simply, the idea of Deshaun does scare opposing defenses still. I think that's safe to say. But when you talk about actual production, he only has the type of catch he had yesterday was, first of all, his longest catch of the year. But he only has four catches of 40 yards or more. So the idea that Deshaun is continually beating teams down the field is is not true. That being said, you know, we'll, we can talk about now whether they'll bring him back. You know, the dots are almost too easy to connect for it to make sense. Um, Deshaun says through, through a source from ESPN – that he's intrigued by the idea of coming back. Um, there was a report from Adam Schefter that the Eagles are going to make a push to bring him back. I, you know, I think this is almost like, if it's so obvious, I just I don't think it's going to happen because one, I will outside of the reasons I don't think it should happen. I think if it was actually going to, we wouldn't hear about it until it does. Very rarely does stuff like this build and build and build and and then actually happen. Um, I think if you're the Redskins. The fact, if the Redskins let him go, you have to ask yourself why they're doing that, number one. I mean, you're going to let him go to a division opponent. Um, when the Redskins are building, it's not like the Redskins' window is closing. I think they're still a team that's building around Kirk Cousins. Um, people talk about they're not going to have the money, but if you get Kirk Cousins signed to a long-term deal this offseason, which is possible, his cap hit is not going to be as high to, as it has been in the past. Um, I was looking at the Redskins' cap situation. It seems to me that they would have enough money to sign Deshaun. Um, So if the Redskins let Deshaun go, as an Eagles fan, you have to ask yourself, why are they doing that? Why would they let him sign with a division opponent if he is that good and that impactful? And they would do it for a few reasons. One, they do it because they know he's on the decline, which his numbers show. Two, they do it because he's he's not only on decline, but when your game is built around speed and you turn 30 and you'll be 31 next season, that then, you know, in that 10, you tend to decline even quicker. And three, I know, you know, we, we can talk about Deshaun's off the field stuff and everyone talks to me about it all the time, but they, they wouldn't let him go if he was a guy they wanted to have in the locker room and build with. So those are three reasons if the Redskins let him go, if you're an Eagles fan, you have to be skeptical of the idea of giving this guy more than a one year deal at all. Cause you're not gonna be able to get him on a one year deal. If you sign Deshaun, it's going to be at least a three year deal, you know, for, I would guess six, $7 million a year. And for an Eagles team, that only that is going into the off season with eleven million dollars in cap space, and then is going to have to cut people to get more, and then have to fill those holes. Those holes. I don't think spending a, a portion, a decent portion of your cap space, on an aging receiver whose game is built on speed, regardless of who it is, if you take the name off of it, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think you're the only one, Mark. I know you're more in that camp. I'm on board if it's for the right price because I think they need multiple weapons at wide receiver. But yesterday, obviously, will uh, it will add to the uh, adventure of Deshaun Jackson because if, you know you, you could just hear it now. Like when March rolls around, and that Elliot was touching on this, Mark. When March rolls around, uh, a majority of fans who, who watch the NFL outside of the Eagles, maybe casually, are going to look back and say, "Look how good he still is," and all that kind of stuff. It, it we do have to point out, and Elliot just did that he's not having big statistical seasons. When he plays the Eagles, though, he decides he's the old Deshaun. He's the young Deshaun Jackson again. It's amazing. Can I, can I, say, can I, can I, can I say one more thing really quick? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Sorry. You've been talking about this. You, you're, you're, you talked about him longer than, your, than that story that you wrote about him. <laughs> All right, so just one more thing I'd say is, why is this leaking now, right? Like, why is this coming out? And the reason I think it is is because I think Deshaun is maybe trying to put pressure on the Redskins to bring him back. Or they're trying to drum up interest, or Deshaun's camp is trying to drum up interest in the idea that when he's a free agent, there'll be that the Redskins, that there's going to be teams that are interested in him. I don't think any of this is actually coming from the Eagles. I guess is what I'm saying. I don't, I don't think the Eagles. Why, why would the Eagles want it to be known they want Deshaun? What? How does? How does that help them at all? I mean, so that's one thing to consider when you when you read these reports. All right, can I can I can I talk now? Go ahead. Sure. You got it the rest of the time. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I let me say this about about Deshaun. He's a different person. The Deshaun Jackson that I spoke with briefly yesterday is not the same Deshaun Jackson that I covered for whatever many years he played for the Eagles and even his first year in Washington. He's different. I don't know. I'm not saying better or worse, but just different. More more mature, maybe. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll go there. 
he also he's made it pretty clear and he's and he's being careful about what he says which is a different too he was very guarded in what he said yesterday when and i kept asking him about coming back and about uh knocking the eagles out of the you know since he's been in washington he's been here three years right that yeah. the Redskins have eliminated the Eagles from the playoffs all three years. They beat them two years ago in Washington. That that knocked them out. They beat them last year at at the link. That knocked them out. They beat them yesterday. That knocked them out. The two years ago when the Redskins stunk and knocked the Eagles out, he was singing and dancing and carrying on about you know we knocked them you know singing a song. I mean, made up the words about knocking the Eagles out of the fly. He was like using the Eagles fight song, but singing his his, his own words to it, having a great time. Happy that they, that he knocked the Eagles out. Yesterday he wouldn't even, you know. I mentioned, I said to him, "It's the third straight year that you've knocked them out of the playoff. You know, knocked them out of going to the playoffs. How do you, you know, do you, do you feel anything about that? Do you feel, you know, a little gratification?" And he, this is, you know, he listen. We have to win our game. Very, very, you know, non-answer. Very non, just you know, typical cliche-ridden. We have to look at our games, blah blah blah. But he did, you know. But he wants, and I think that's because he wants to come back. He. Deshaun Jackson wants to be an Eagle again. There's no doubt in my mind after talking to him yesterday. He wants to be. Now, do the Eagles want him? That I don't know. That I can't. Only Howie Roseman, Doug Peterson, Luke Jeffrey Lurie can answer that, I guess. But he. there's no doubt that he wants. And the Redskins are, are, are not bringing. The Redskins drafted a wide receiver in the first round last year. Josh Doxson, who's been on injured re, reserve this year. That's their, And they're going to re-sign Pierre Gar, Garçon, who's also a free agent. And they have Crowder. There's no room at the end for for Deshaun. They're gonna let. They're not going to re-sign him to a six million dollar a year, or eight million dollar a year contract because they've invested a first round pick in his replacement. So they're moving on from him, and he knows it. I mean, he's not stupid. He knows they drafted a wide receiver in the first round that he's his days there are, are done. So I don't know where else he may want to go, but he, in his heart of hearts, he wants to be a Philadelphia Eagle again. There's no doubt in my mind. And I, I agree with you that he wants to come back. And I think he wants to come back for a couple reasons. One, because I don't think there'll be a ton of interest in him as a free agent. I think it's a natural fit. Two, I'm sure he I mean he liked it in Philadelphia. He probably liked the idea of coming back here. The Eagles have a cool. He just wants to hang with you a little too. Yeah, yeah. He misses me, obviously. But but three, I think part of him wants to come back because when he was here in Philadelphia the first time with Andy Reid, well and then obviously the two years with Chip or the one year with Chip. But um, now he's got Andy Reid Jr. as the head coach of the Eagles. I think he liked how he had it when he was here in Philadelphia the last time. And part of that led to the problem. I mean, like, you know, you you referenced the story about his off-the-field problems. But outside of just that, he was cutting practice, you know, to hang out with friends under Andy Reid and Chip. I mean, there were issues with Deshaun outside of, of just the, his friends. So, you know, you, you look, you, you talked to Deshaun yesterday. You know, you're not the only person that said he seemed like a changed man and all those things. But would you bring him back? Oh me no, I, I'm on the record. Right, well, <laughs> I, I don't want. I don't want. Not, and again, like as to use your words, which was very good. Take his name off. It. Just, uh, Joe right. Smith, thirty-one year old. I don't want to. If I'm the Eagles, I'm not signing anyone thirty-one years old next year. I don't want anybody. Any position, maybe maybe a long snapper of Dorian Bosa's earlier. I don't want anyone else thirty-one years old. That's not what the Eagles are. The Eagles. That's why. They, that's why McKelvin was a terrible signing. This team should be going young, not getting not. Not getting a 31 year old often injured, he misses games every year. Mm-hmm. Wide receiver whose game is built on speed wants to speed like a guy like Anquan Bolden. He could play till he's 100 because his game isn't based off his game. His game is based off toughness and catching that six yard pass on third and five, and and you could do that for a long, long time. When your game is built on speed, once you lose that, you're done. Irving Fryer. I saw right. I saw that he was great. Boom, done. I mean, because he lost a, he, he lost a half a second. Boom, that's all it takes. And, 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 and that's my point is the Redskins have him in the building. They have Deshaun right now. They've had him for three years, and you're right. They've, they've eliminated the Eagles. I mean, that's not only because of Deshaun, even though he does kill them every time. But they have the Deshaun all the Eagles fans want. They have him. They've had him. The, the Redskins, right? And what have they done? You just mentioned it. They drafted somebody in the first round. They're going to re-sign Pierre Garçon. They have Crowder. I mean, they've started to build for life without Deshaun. Not because they can't afford him, but because they don't want to keep him. If if they wanted to keep him, they could have redid his deal this past offseason. Deshaun probably would have done that. They could they could you know not have used their uh, first round. They have other needs. The Redskins, I think their greater needs are on defense. Don't you agree? No, I I do. Yeah, Yeah, they could have drafted a linebacker, a cornerback, a defensive tackle, anything last year in the first round. They took Josh Doxson, who is going to be. I mean, 
all in the case, he hasn't played yet because unfortunately for them, he got hurt, but he was a pretty good wide receiver in college. He was, I believe, the second receiver taken after um, Corey Coleman. So there's a, I mean, they, the Redskins think a lot of him. I know, I, I, I agree. So, that, so that, that's my point again. Take the Sean's name off of it. Why is this team letting, letting him go if he's that good? No, exactly. Because they don't right. think he is anymore. Well, the other thing is, and I, I don't, I think your point makes sense, Elliot, but they do have a lot of weapons, right? Like they don't need, I, I think I saw a graphic on Fox yesterday. He's what, fourth or fifth on their team in receptions? And that's just one stat, whatever. I mean, but they, ha- they clearly have a lot of guys. Like that's the only reason I think it makes some sense for the Eagles. The Eagles don't have anybody. Like we're starting from ground zero to build weapons here for the quarterback. Like Matthews is going to be here. Who else? And Ertz is going to be here. Who else is going to be but, here? But in year? two years, in two years, when well, the Eagles are legitimate Super Bowl, if all right, if in two years Eagles are legitimate Super Bowl contenders, right? Like because if you have a really good quarterback and you do the right things, you, sooner or later you'll you'll be one of those teams. Definitely. In, a, in two years, is Deshaun going to be a player that the Eagles can count on in a Dece- in a January playoff game? No, probably not. So that that's my Are point. I don't I don't disagree with you, Joe. If 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 Deshaun hits the free agency market and you know there's no other interest and he's really cheap, like yes, he's obviously an upgrade at receiver for this team, even on the decline. I agree with you. He steps onto this roster and he's probably the best receiver. But my point is, what are you what are you building with that? You get a year of Deshaun where he catches a few deep passes and the Eagles still go eight and eight and you know you risk him. Look, maybe he is a change guy. I don't know, but you risk bringing him into this locker room that you're trying to let Carson Wentz build and take over and do all those things. Zach Ertz, Jordan Matthews, these are the players, Fletcher Cox, these are the players that the Eagles are building with. Deshaun, whatever deal they give him, is not a building-type player. You, you, you have to have a long-term view with this Eagles team because you do have a long, because you do have a quarterback to build around. So, yeah, if, he, if he's one year, $4 million, of course he's an upgrade. But in two years, when the Eagles are hopefully, for, for them, playing in a playoff game and it's cold, is Deshaun going to be a player that that's gonna, can be counted on? And I don't think that's the case. He hasn't been. He hasn't been a lot in his career. There's no doubt about that. And but it's, this is going to be fascinating because clearly there's interest from his part. Clearly he's marketing himself, Mark. Whether it is is true or not, or you, your feeling. But I've heard it from others too that have been around that he's a changed man. And the Eagles have a hole there, and the fans want him back. Like this story's not going away until he signs somewhere else. And I I don't think there's a lot to this. And I'd be interested in getting Mark's take on it. But I do think maybe there's a little bit of Howie saying, "All right." Chip got rid of him, and I'll bring him back. I don't think you – hopefully you wouldn't make a decision based off of that. But I do think that the deep – the deep – I don't want to use the word hatred, but I guess I will. The deep hatred between Chip and Howie is so deep that I, I could see how – like that maybe playing a small factor. Just wow on that, but <laughs> – you disagree? No, I I tend to agree. And that's – I mean, I, I didn't think of that. But, I mean, that's – that's if that's how they're, if that's how they're going to build this team – it's going to be another fifty-six years before they win anything. I agree. I agree with you hundred percent. You're going to build, you're going to sign guys because the, your old coach didn't like them. Oh, good. That's that's, that's a smart way of doing it. I mean, look at the past off season. They got rid of Demarco. They got rid of Kiko. They got rid of yeah Maxwell. All the players, Eric Rowe. Hmm. Yeah, and who all of them are having decent seasons. I mean, I don't know as much about Rowe, but it, every time I read about him, he's, like, he's playing on the best team in football. That's all I know. Yeah, yeah the, of all of them, the row one, the row one did feel like the most, you know, we just don't want him here. He was the last regime's guy. And because they don't obviously they don't have much a corner, as we've been seeing week in, week out. All right, guys, we look forward three games to go here. I mean, look, this looks like it's going to be a difficult chore in Baltimore on Sunday when you guys are down there. Then the two home division games to wrap it up um, outside of Wentz. We'll do this instead of just breaking down the game because, you know, Baltimore hasn't even played their game. Um, they're playing on Monday night before we talk about them. Give me something you guys are looking for down the stretch of the season outside of just Carson Wentz. It could be coaching. It could be a, a player you're looking at to see how he finishes. Just something outside of Wentz because that's clearly for all of us priority one when we watch the Eagles right now, how Wentz continues to develop. Elliot, we'll start with you. I have a few, um, but I'll only say one because I don't want to take it from Mark. No, no, no. Not that. <laughs> um, I mean, for me, I guess it would be Nelson Aguilar because – I, you know, it's crazy to say this about a guy that only has, I think, six catches for 40-something yards over the past two weeks. But I do think he's looked like an improved player since his benching. And the interesting thing about Aguilar is to, the Eagles can't really cut him this offseason. The, the cap numbers don't work out. You don't really save a lot of money. You're basically – the dead cap is almost even to what it would be to keep him. So 
to cut him doesn't make much sense. Um, I think at this point, I think it's safe to say his value is at a, almost an all-time low. So you're not going to get a ton from him in a trade. So I would just, I think the Eagles need to address the receiver position, but I'm just interested to see if Aguilar over these next, you know, three games can can turn into not a number two receiver because I don't think he's that, but you know, if he's your number three next year, if you bring in, if you draft a guy really high, um, and you sign a free agent, and Aguilar is your third or fourth guy, I don't think that's a bad spot for him. So. I'm just interested to see if he continues to show signs of improvement and uh, and end the season on a high note for him. Because um, I do think he's he I do think he's has improved since he was benched. I've covered a team 32 years, I think it is, yeah, 32, and I don't think I've ever covered a team that lost all their division games. So I want to see if they can do that. <laughs> Another one you could check off the list. Yeah, they, they, even that year they went three and 13. One of the three was the win over the uh, Redskins. So. Uh, I want to see them go zero and six in the division. That'd be kind of cool. The other, the other one I'll add before we, before we end this is I didn't steal I, it from you. That wasn't one. You no, made. that wasn't mine. That's a good one though. Um, I if I'm the Eagles, I would really be wishing Vitae was healthy right now because they have an interesting decision to make with Jason Peters because they it would one of the ways they could go with this is simply just cut Jason Peters. It saves them eight or nine million dollars in cap space. Put Lane Johnson at left tackle and start Vitae next year at right. I mean, that would be a very logical way to go with this. But the fact that Lane Johnson's one suspension away from a two-year ban, the fact that Vitae has been up and down, probably more down this year than up, and is now hurt, the Eagles have an interesting decision to make with those three players. So if Vitae was healthy, that I think number one on my list of what I want to see over the next few weeks is how Vitae plays. Um, but since he's not, obviously that, that can't happen, but it'll he's be interesting to see what the Eagles right? decide to do. Could he be back this week, or is he still? I guess we'll have to, we'll have to it wait. Doesn't, when they talk about him, they talk about him like he might be like dead. Like it's not even like maybe there's a possibility. It's like every week, it's like oh yeah, he's still week to week. So I do think he's he's. You think he's done for the year? It wouldn't shock me, especially now. Why why put him out there if he's not 100? percent Well, the reason you put him out there, I mean, no, he's not really 100%, but you don't want to make right. it worse. Yeah, but he's. I mean, he he's a key piece of their future because if you don't think he's a starting tackle. Then you probably have to keep oh. Peters. You you have to obviously keep playing, and you probably have to draft a tackle early. But if you think he's someone that can develop and play opposite lane, then you know you don't need a tackle in the first round. So Vitae is like a, their evaluation of Vitae, whether if they get it right or wrong, is going to be pretty big in the development of this team because they have to get that evaluation right on him, whether they don't think he's good and they move on, or if they decide he's good and then stick with him. Hey, let me ask you something. If you guys can, can we switch up for a second? Since you sure. brought up drafting in the first round, I think I think I think the three of us agree that cornerback is would be the ideal first round pick. Yes, and, I, it's, and it seems like there's a good number of well, legitimate all, first but, round corners. But depending on where this Viking pick winds up, what if I'm just going to throw this hypothetical at you guys? What if the top four corners are off the board? Because I think corners, I think corners are going to fly off the board. I think a lot of teams drafting high may take corners. Let's say the top four corners are gone. So you can get the fifth corner at, let's, let's say they're picking 18 with the Vikings. That's that's probably where it's going to, depend what the Vikings do the last three games, but 17, 18. Right. Um, but the number one wide receiver is still available. Do you, do you, do you opt for the fifth best corner or the best wide receiver? Uh, I mean, I know my answer. I mean, I, if Mike Williams from Clemson is that's available the, at 18, I, I, I best, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely 100% take Mike Williams. I yeah. wouldn't reach for a corner. You, no, I wouldn't either. That guy you take, the fifth best, might not be much better than the ninth or tenth best, but you can get in the second round. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with you that it, I agree with, it's a deep cornerback. You know, guys are going to go quickly. I'd be surprised if four were taken in the first 17 picks. But I, overall, I agree with you. I would not, Elliot. I'm telling you. I think, right. I think four, I, I think depending on where that Viking pick lands, four corners could be off the board. Well, then it's up to your guy, Howie, to read the board, right? Like, I, I, I agree <laughs> with your premise, Mark, that if, if there really are nine legitimate you know, NFL corners in this draft and you think you can get one of them in the second round, like that eighth best one, instead of reaching for the fifth best one in the first round, and there's not that much difference, and you get the best receiver, that makes sense. Uh, I, we'll see if Howie uh, thinks like you. Oh, God. <laughs> Shoot me now. <laughs> all right well we we will wrap on that and obviously we have a lot to look forward to with that kind of talk as, as time goes along so three games to go you guys will be in baltimore on sunday for the eagles and the baltimore ravens as the uh they play their final road game of the season five and eight we'll see how this thing finishes elliot 
as always, thanks for doing this. Yep, talk to you guys soon. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Joe. And thanks to all of you for listening to episode 56 of the No Huddle Show right here on NJ.com. You can subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, anywhere you listen to podcasts. You can find our podcast and leave us a rating. It helps the show grow. We'll be back next week right here on NJ.com. Yeah.